Hello there everyone! In this module, we'll be learning about gestational diabetes. Let's start with a quick overview. Gestational diabetes is characterized by hyperglycemia and insulin resistance with onset during pregnancy. More than one-third of women with gestational diabetes will develop type 2 diabetes within 10 years of delivery. Gestational diabetes is the most common in the second and third trimesters when the placenta produces sufficient human placental lactogen. Human placental lactogen is secreted by trophoblasts and is the major diabetogenic hormone of pregnancy. Human placental lactogen increases both insulin resistance and secretion during pregnancy. The net result is an increased supply of glucose to the fetus. Diabetes that exists before pregnancy or with symptom onset before 20 weeks is typically not pregnancy-related due to the lesser impact of insulin resistance in the early stages of gestation. This is defined as overt diabetes or diabetes mellitus in pregnancy. Patients with overt diabetes or diabetes mellitus in pregnancy are more likely than patients with gestational diabetes to have significant hyperglycemia during pregnancy and postpartum hyperglycemia, as well as having a lower body mass index. This is because they may be type 1 diabetics, who are less likely to be overweight or obese than patients with type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes. Let's take a look at the etiology. The etiology of gestational diabetes involves various risk factors, including a personal history of impaired glucose tolerance or prior gestational diabetes mellitus. Other risk factors for developing prior gestational diabetes mellitus include maternal age greater than 25, a body mass index greater than 30 kilograms per meter squared pre-pregnancy, a family history of diabetes mellitus, previous unexplained abortion or stillbirth, glycosuria at first prenatal visit, multiple gestation, polycystic ovarian syndrome, glucocorticoid use, hypertension, and being a member of an ethnic group with a high prevalence of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Being part of certain ethnic groups including Hispanic American, African American, Native American, South or East Asian, and Pacific Islander can also increase the risk of developing gestational diabetes. Suspect overt or pregestational diabetes if glucose intolerance manifests earlier in pregnancy. Now let's learn about the diagnosis. Pregnant parents with gestational diabetes are usually asymptomatic but they will have an abnormal glucose tolerance test. At 24 to 28 weeks of gestation, a 50-gram, one-hour glucose challenge test is routinely performed for gestational diabetes. It consists of the following steps. Administer a 50-gram oral glucose load. Check the plasma glucose one hour later. This test is administered without regard to the timing of the previous meal. A one-hour plasma glucose value of greater than or equal to 140 mg per deciliter is considered a positive glucose challenge test and is an indication to proceed to the 100-gram, three-hour oral glucose tolerance test. Note that some providers use a lower cutoff value for a positive glucose challenge test. The 100-gram, three-hour oral glucose tolerance test consists of an initial fasted glucose measurement, followed by administration of the glucose load and subsequent plasma measurement for each hour afterward for three hours. This requires that the patient has fasted overnight for at least eight hours. The 100-gram, three-hour oral glucose tolerance test is considered positive for gestational diabetes if greater than or equal to two of the following plasma glucose values are present. At fasting, having greater than or equal to 95 mg per deciliter. At one hour, having greater than or equal to 180 mg per deciliter. At two hours, having greater than or equal to 155 mg per deciliter. 
and at three hours having greater than or equal to 140 milligrams per deciliter. Associated laboratory findings for gestational diabetes include elevated glucose prior to and during pregnancy, increased hemoglobin A1c if glucose control is poor, and the presence of anti-insulin and anti-islet cell antibodies in cases of type 1 diabetes mellitus. Ultrasound and echocardiogram should be used to identify fetal cardiac, neurologic, and growth abnormalities. Now we'll learn about management. Treatment of diabetes mellitus in pregnancy primarily involves diet and exercise. However, insulin may be required in cases of type 1 diabetes mellitus or type 2 diabetes that is not adequately controlled with lifestyle modifications alone. Medications may be necessary for patients who fail to keep their fasting glucose below 95 mg per deciliter and one hour postprandial glucose below 140 mg per deciliter or two hour postprandial levels below 120 mg per deciliter with non-pharmacologic therapy. Insulin is the first-line agent for patients with gestational diabetes who do not achieve sufficient glycemic control with nutritional therapy and exercise alone. Metformin and gliburide are valid alternatives if insulin therapy is not possible. However, gliburide may have higher rates of macrosomia and neonatal hypoglycemia. Key components of the management of pregnancies with gestational diabetes mellitus treated with pharmacotherapy include the following. At 32 weeks gestational age, antenatal testing twice per week consisting of a non-stress test plus an amniotic fluid index evaluation. At 36 weeks gestational age, ultrasound screening to assess for macrosomia. At 39 weeks gestational age, Consider induction of labor. In cases where the estimated fetal weight is greater than or equal to 4,500 grams, scheduled cesarean delivery may be recommended. In situations of poor glucose control or maternal complications, early fetal delivery should be considered after fetal lung maturity assessment and corticosteroid administration. Now let's go over the complications. Poorly controlled maternal diabetes mellitus, whether gestational or pregestational, can cause caudal regression syndrome, a rare but severe neural tube defect classically associated with poor glycemic control in the birthing parent during pregnancy. Caudal regression syndrome leads to hypoplasia of the lumbar spine, pelvis, and lower limbs. The gastrointestinal and genitourinary tracts may also be affected. Fetal complications associated with gestational diabetes include macrosomia, the most common complication, polyhydramnios, which is often due to fetal polyuria, delayed pulmonary maturity, uteroplacental insufficiency, which can lead to intrauterine growth restriction or intrauterine fetal demise, cardiac defects, including transposition of the great vessels and phallos tetralogy, neural tube defects, sacral agenesis, and renal agenesis. Maternal complications associated with diabetes mellitus in pregnancy include preeclampsia, renal insufficiency, retinopathy, diabetic ketoacidosis, and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. Perinatal and postnatal complications associated with gestational diabetes mellitus include hypocalcemia, respiratory distress, delayed neurologic maturation, polycythemia, neonatal jaundice, traumatic delivery, brachial plexus injury, and hypoglycemia, which is often due to increased fetal insulin in response to increased maternal glucose. 
Thank you for listening to this module. We'll see you next time.